Good evening. And welcome to the Creepy Little Book. It's a show with a focus on the fringe and mysterious. Everything from the esoteric to the extraterrestrial, the spiritual to the supernatural. And all that lies between. I'm your humble host, P. A simple master of mysteries and antiquary of the arcane. Or perhaps... It's a weirdo in the dark. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. At the end of the day, it's absolutely up to you to decide. But we have a good time here. Each and every night, a Monday through Friday, a 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, delving into new mysteries. And mysteries abound. As we'll be discussing tonight, the story of Nicholas Rorick and the Chintamani Stone. Oh yeah, we're talking magical wishing stones tonight, folks. A little Dragon Ball Z action happening here. But before we begin, let me take a moment to say thank you to our moderator, Tina Tomaszewski. Much appreciation for you being here tonight, Tina. Thank you for holding it down in the chat. It looks like my light has decided to abscond from the wall yet again. So I'm going to go ahead and take a second to repair that issue. telling you, I'm going to drill a hole in the wall and fix this thing there for good. I think that I'm left with no other option at this point. I must make modifications. <laughs> anyway, thank you for being here tonight. It is the creepy little book. I am your host, Pete, and tonight's topic is Nicholas Rourke and the Chintamani Stone. Again, I want to thank our moderator, Tina Tomaszewski. I want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in tonight, hanging out with us, spending your hour with us, spending your time with us. I got a quick super chat to get to. Hopefully he's still here. Deranged Lunatic, a.k.a. DL, for $4.99. Thank you, Deranged Lunatic. Much appreciation. Deranged says, won't be able to stay tired and want to go to bed early. But I wanted to say hello to everyone. I'll catch the episode later. Well, thank you, DL. Uh, much appreciation to Deranged Lunatic. And, uh, and, and thank you uh, yet again. Very good, sir. So, yeah, good to see everybody tonight. Uh, username says duct tape. That's right. Duct tape would be the way to go. I don't want to duct tape the walls though. Like I really just figure I could probably put two screws in this and it'd be there for good. And, and we would not have the problem that we've been having with it falling down on me. <laughs> Repeatedly in the middle of a live stream. It's just, uh, it's just uh, unnerving a little bit, if you will. Anyway, let's talk about Nicholas Rorick. Who was this guy? He was born in 1874, and he died in 1947. He was a painter, a writer, an archaeologist, a theosophist, a philosopher, and a public figure. His youth, he was influenced by Russian symbolism, a movement in Russian society centered on the spiritual. He was interested in hypnosis and other spiritual practices, and his paintings are said to have a hypnotic expression. Born in St. Petersburg to well-to-do notary public Baltic German father and to a Russian mother, Rourke lived in various places in the world until his death in India. Trained as an artist and a lawyer, his main interests were literature, philosophy, archaeology, and especially art. He was a dedicated activist for the cause of preserving art and architecture during times of war. He was nominated several times to the long list for the Nobel Peace Prize. The so-called Rorick Pact was signed into law by the United States and most other nations of the Pan-American Union in April of 1935. Raised in late 19th century St. Petersburg, Rorick enrolled simultaneously at St. Petersburg University and the Imperial Academy of the Arts in 1893. He received the title of artist in 1897 and a degree in law the next year. He found early employment with the Imperial Society for the Encouragement of the Arts, whose school he directed from 1906 to 1917. Despite early tensions with the group, he became a member of Sergei Dalyagovev's World of Art Society, and he was president of it from 1910 to 1916. Artistically, Rourke became known as his generation's most talented painter of Russians' ancient past, a topic that was compatible with his lifelong interest in archaeology. He also succeeded as a stage designer by achieving his greatest fame as one of the designers for Diglyov's Ballet's Russus. His best-known designs were for Alexander Borodin's Prince Igor, 
1909 in later productions, and costumes and sets for the Rites of Spring, 1913, composed by Igor Stravinsky. Along with Mikhail Vubrel and Mikhail Nesterov, Rorik is considered a major representative of Russian symbolism in art. From an early period in his life, he was influenced by Apocrypha and medieval sectarian writings, such as the mysterious Dove Book. Another of Rorik's artistic subjects was architecture. He, uh, his acclaimed publication, Architectural Studies, 1904-05, consists of dozens of paintings he made of fortresses, monasteries, churches, and other monuments during long trips through Russia. It inspired his decades-long career as an activist on behalf of artistic and architectural preservation. He also designed religious art for places of worship throughout Russia and the Ukraine, most notably the Queen of Heaven fresco for the Church of the Holy Spirit, which the patroness Maria Teshnishev built near her Talashkino estate, and the stained glass window for Datsan Gunzek Holeni in 1913 and 1915. His designs for the Talashkino church were so radical that the Orthodox Church refused to consecrate the building. During the first decades of the 1900s and the early 1910s, Rorik, largely influenced by his wife Helena, developed an interest in Eastern religions, as well as alternatives to Christianity, belief systems such as theosophy. Both Rorik's became avid readers of the Vandant essays of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda, the poetry of Rabindranatha Tagore, and the Bhagavad Gita. The Rorks committed to occult mysticism increased steadily. It was especially intense during World War I and the 1917 Russian Revolution, to which the couple, like many other Russian intellectuals, accorded apocalyptic significance. The influence of theosophy, uh, Vedanta, Buddhism, and other mystical topics can be detected not only in many of Rorik's paintings, but also in many short stories and poems that Rourke wrote before and after the 1917 revolutions, including the Flowers of Morai cycle, which was begun in 1907 and completed in 1921. After the February Revolution of 1917 and the end of the Tsarist regime, Rorik, a political moderate who valued Russia's cultural heritage more than ideology and party politics, had an active part in artistic politics. With Maxim Gorky and Alexander Benos, he participated in the so-called Gorky Commission and its successor organization, the Arts Union. Both attempted to gain the attention of the provincial government and the Petrograd Soviet on the need to form a coherent cultural policy and most urgently to protect art and architecture from destruction and vandalism. Meanwhile, illness forced Rorik to leave the capital and reside in Kaliria, the district bordering Finland. He had already quit the presidency of the World Art Society and now quit the directorship of the School of Imperial Society for the Encouragement of the Arts. After the October Revolution, the acquisition of power of the Lenin Bolsheviks party, Rourke became increasingly discouraged about Russia's political future. During early 1918, he, Helena, and their two sons, George and Stavoslav, emigrated to Finland. Two unresolved historical debates are associated with Rourke's departure. First, it is often claimed that Rourke was a major candidate to direct the People's Commissant of Culture, the Soviet equivalent to a Ministry of Culture, which the Bolsheviks considered establishing in 1917 and 1918, but he refused to accept the job. In fact, Bonois was most likely choice to direct any such commissant. It seems that Rorik was a preferred choice to manage his Department of Artistic Education. This topic is rendered moot by the fact that the Soviets elected not to establish such a commissant to Riyadh. Second, when Rorik later wished to reconcile with the Soviet Union, he maintained he had not left Soviet Russia deliberately, but that he and his family, living in Kaliria, had been isolated from their homeland when the Finnish Civil War began. However, Rorik had an amply documented extreme hostility to the Bolshevik regime, prompted not so much by a dislike of communism, but uh, by his revulsion of Lenin's ruthlessness and his fear that Bolshevism would result in the destruction of Russia's artistic and architectural heritage. He illustrated Leni Leniud, uh, Leonid Andrinev's anti-communist Polemek SOS and had widely published pamphlets, Violators of the Arts, Rorik believed that the triumph of Russian culture would come about through a new appreciation of ancient myth and legend. After some months in Finland and Scandinavia, the Roriks relocated to London, arriving in the mid-1919s. Engrossed with theosophical mysticism, they now had millenarian expectations that a new age was imminent. They wished to travel to India as soon as possible. 
They joined the English Welsh chapter of the Theosophical Society. It was in London in March 1920 that the Rorks founded their own school of mysticism, Agni Yoga, which they referred to as the system of living ethics. To earn passage to India, Rorick worked as a stage designer for Thomas Beachman's Covenant Garden Theater, but the enterprise ended unsuccessfully in 1920, and he never received payment for his work. Among notable peoples Rorick befriended while in England were the famed British Buddhist Christmas Humphreys, the philosopher author H.G. Wells, the Nobel laureate Robin Dronthan Thagore, whose grandniece Devika Rani would later marry Rorik's son, Stevoslav. A successful exhibition in London resulted in an invitation from the director of the Art Institute of Chicago, offering to arrange for Rorik's art to tour the United States. In the autumn of 1920, Rorik's traveled to America by sea. The Rorik's remained in the United States from October 1920 until May 1923. A large exhibition of Rorik's art, organized partly by the U.S. impresario Christian Brinton, and partly by the Chicago Art Institute, began in New York in December 1920 and toured the country, to San Francisco and back. In early 1921 and 22, Rourke befriended acclaimed soprano Mary Garden of the Chicago Opera and received a commission to design a 1922 production of Rimsky Korsakoff's The Snow Maiden for her. During the exhibition, the Rourke spent a significant amount of time in Chicago, New Mexico, and California. Politically, Rorik was at first anti-Bolshevik. He gave lectures and wrote articles to white Russian populations in which he criticized the Soviet Union. However, his aversion to communism, the imperialist monster that lies to humanity, changed in America. He claimed that his spiritual masters, the Mahatmas in the Himalayas, were communicating telepathically with him through his wife, Helena, who was a mystic and a clairvoyant. The beings from an esoteric Buddhist community in India were said to have told Rorik that Russia was destined for a mission on Earth that led him to formulate his great plan, which envisioned a unification of millions of Asian people through a religious movement using a future Buddha, the Maitreya, into a second union of the East. There, the king of Shambhala would, following the Maitreya prophecies, make his appearance to fight a great battle against all evil forces on Earth. Rorik understood that as a perfection towards common good, the new polity was to include Southwest Atlia, Tuvan, Burutia, Outer and Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, and Tibet, with its capital in Zenvigorod, the city of tolling bells, which to be, was to be built at the foot of Mount Belakunha. In Altali, according to Rorik, the same Mahatmas revealed to him that in 1922, he was an incar incarnation of the fifth Dalai Lama. <clears throat> in 1923, Rorik, the practical idealist, set out in the Himalayas with his wife and son, Yuri. Rorik initially settled in the Dajiring in the same house that in the 13th uh, Dalai Lama had stayed during his exile in India. Rorik spent some time painting the Himalayas with visitors such as Frederick Marsh and Bailey, Lady Linton, and the Dali and uh, members of the 1924 British Everest expedition, as well as the so named Wangfell Leiden La Kusho Doring and the Tossarong Shape, influential Tibetans. According to British intelligence, Lamas from the Moru Monastery recognized Rorik as an incarnation of the fifth Dalai Lama due to a mole pattern on his right cheek. It was during his stay in the Himalayas that Rorik learned about the flight of the ninth Panchen Lama which he interpreted as the fulfillment of the Maitreya prophecy and the bringing about of the age of Shambhala. In 1924, the Rorks returned to the West. On his way to America, Rorik stopped at the Soviet embassy in Berlin, where he told the local uh, plenipotentiary about a Central Asian expedition he wanted to take. He asked for Soviet protection on his way and shared his impressions of politics in India and Tibet. Rorik commented on the occupation of Tibet by the British, claiming that they infiltrate in small parties, conduct extensive anti-Soviet propaganda by talking about anti-religious activity of the Bolsheviks. The plenipotentiary later pointed out to one of Rorik's old university classmates that he had absolutely pro-Soviet leanings, which looked somewhat budo communistic and that his son, who spoke 28 Asian languages, helped him in gaining favor with the Indians and the Tibetans. The Rorik settled in New York City, which became the base of many American operations for them. 
They founded several institutions during these years, the Flaming Heart and the Crown of the World, both of which were meant to unite artists around the globe in the cause of civic activism. The Master Institute of the United Arts and Art School with a versatile curriculum and the eventual home of the first Nicholas Rourke Museum and an American Angi Yogi Society. They also joined various theosophical societies and their activities with these groups dominated their lives. <clears throat> All right, here's where it gets really wild. And we'll get into some Chintamani Stone stuff after this part here. After leaving New York, the Roricks, together with their son and six friends, begin a five year Rorick Asian expedition that, in Rorick's own words, started from Sikkim through Punjab, Kashmir, and Lakka and the Karakorma Mountains, Kotang, Kashgar, Kurashar, Urumqi, Urshjist, the Altil Mountains, and the Oirat regions of Mongolia, the central Gobi, Kansu, Sadiam, and Tibet, with a detour through Siberia to Moscow in 1926. The Rourke's Asian Expedition attracted attention from the foreign services and intelligence agencies in the Soviet Union, the United States, United Kingdom, and Japan. In fact, prior to this expedition, Rorik had solicited the help of the Soviet government and the Bolshevik secret police to assist him in his expedition by promising in return to monitor British activities in the area. But he received only a lukewarm response from Mikhail Abramovichy Telesio, the chief of the Soviet foreign intelligence. The Bolsheviks assisted Rorik with his logistics while he was traveling through Siberia and Mongolia. However, they did not commit themselves to his reckless project of the Sacred Union of the East, a spiritual utopia that boiled down to Rorik's ambitious attempts to stir the Buddhist masses of Inner Asia to create a highly spiritual cooperative commonwealth under the patronage of Bolshevik Russia. The official mission of his expedition, as Rorik put it, was to act as an emissary of Western Buddhism to Tibet. To Western media, it was presented as an artistic and scientific enterprise. Rorick reported seeing a metallic oval in the sky over Tibet. Decades later, UFO enthusiasts would claim that Rorick expedition witnessed a flying saucer. Between the summer of 1927 and June 1928, the expedition was thought to have been lost as communication with them had ceased. They had, in fact, been attacked in Tibet. And Rorick wrote that only the superiority of our firearms prevented bloodshed. But in spite of our having Tibet passports, the expedition was forcibly stopped by Tibetan authorities. They were detained by the government for five months and were forced to live in tents in sub-zero conditions and subsist on meager rations. Five men of the expedition died during this time. In March 1928, they were allowed to leave Tibet and they trekked south to settle in India where they founded a research center, the Himalayan Research Institute. In 1929, Rorick was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by the University of Paris. He received two more nominations in 32 and 35. His concern for peace resulted in his creation of the Pax Cultural, the Red Cross of Art Culture. He worked for this cause and also resulted in the United States and 20 other nations of the Pan American Union signing the Rorick Pact, an early international instrument protecting cultural property. And they signed this on April 15th, 1935 at the White House. During 1934 and 1935, the Department of Agriculture, then headed by Rorick admirer Henry A. Wallace, sponsored an expedition by Rorick and its scientists H.G. McMillan and James F. Stevens to Inner Mongolia, Manchuria, and China. The expedition's purpose was to collect seeds of plants which prevented soil erosion. The expedition consisted of two parts. In 1934, they explored the greater Kingon region mountains and Bargon Plateau in western Manchuria. In 1935, they explored parts of Inner Mongolia, the Gobi Desert, the Ordos Desert, and the Halainan Mountains. The expedition found almost 300 species of xerophytes, collected herbs, conducted archaeological studies, and found antique manuscripts of great significant importance. Rourke was in India during World War II, where he painted Russian epic, heroic, and saintly themes, including Alexander Nevsky, The Flight of Mistyev and Redida, and Boris and Gleb. In 1942, Rourke received Januwahel Nahiru and his daughter Indra Gahandi at his house in Kululu. Together, they discussed the fate of the New World. We spoke about Indian Russian cultural associations. I think it's time to think about useful and creative cooperation. Indriya Gandhi would later recall several days spent together with Rorik's family. 
That was a memorable visit to a surprising and gifted family where each member was a remarkable figure in himself with a well-defined range of interests. Rorick himself stays in my memory. He was a man with extensive knowledge and enormous experience, a man with a big heart, deeply influenced by all that he observed. During the visit, ideas and thoughts about closer cooperation between India and the USSR were expressed. Now, after India wins independence, they've got its own real implementation. And as you know, there are friendly and mutually understanding relationships today between both our countries. In 1942, the American-Russian Cultural Association was created in New York. Its active participants were Ernest Hemingway, Rockwell Kent, Charlie Chaplin, Emil Cooper, Sarge Kovyevsky, and Valeria Inachevich Tetrachenko. Its activity was welcomed by scientists such as Robert McMillan and Arthur Compton. Rourke had lengthy correspondence with Henry Wallace. He was the 1948 Progressive Party for candidate uh, for U.S. president. And when Rourke and Wallace were writing these letters back and forth to each other, it had leaked to the press that they were in communication. And the scandal of it was that he was conducting, you know, he was a, a U.S. presidential candidate who had been the vice president. Henry Wallace was a former vice president. And when these letters came out, they called it the guru letters and it made a big scandal and it ruined his political career. Uh, you know, they, they thought he was just, you know, kind of a little bit off. Uh, Rorick died on December 13th, 1947. In the 21st century, the Nicholas Rorick Museum in New York City is a major institution for Rorick's artistic work. Numerous Rorick societies continue to promote his theosophical teachings worldwide. His paintings can be seen in several museums, including the Rorick Department of the State Museum of Oriental Arts in Moscow, the Rorick Museum at the International Center for the Rorick's in Moscow, the Russian State Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, a collection in the Tetryovsky Gallery in Moscow, in the Art Museum in Novorinsky, an important collection in the National Gallery for Foreign Arts in Bulgaria, uh, Serbia, India, and various art museums in India. A selection featuring his larger work was featured in the Latvian National Museum of Art. His biography and his controversial expeditions to Tibet and Manchuria have been examined recently by a number of authors, including two Russians, Vladimir Rosov and Alexandre Andreev. Two Americans, Andrea Zanemsky and John McCarran, and in German, Ernest von Waldenfels. A series of studies on Himalayan ranges denoted by the artist's son, 36 works specifically, are even showcased in the Nicholas Rourke Gallery of the Kanakartya Chikaralia Parishath Museum based in Bangalore, India. The hypnotic, immersive nature of his works truly absorbs the onlooker, leading one with a sense of peace and tranquility as one moves with the series through the gallery. H.P. Lovecraft refers numerous times to the strange and disturbing Asian paintings of Nicholas Rorick in his Antarctic horror story at the Mountains of Madness. Rorick was awarded the Order of St. Sava, the minor planet 4426 Rorick in the solar system, was named in honor of Rorick. In June 2013, during Russian Art Week in London, Rorick's Madonna Laboris sold at auction at Boham Shop for 7,881,250 pounds, including the buyer's premium, making it the most valuable painting ever sold at a Russian art auction. But some say that when he was on these expeditions to Tibet in the Himalayas, that what he was doing was looking for Shambhala because he had to take a piece of the Chintamani stone back to return it there. So what is the Chintamani stone? It is a wish-fulfilling jewel within both Hindu and Buddhist traditions, said by some to be the equivalent of the Philosopher's Stone in Western alchemy. It's one of several Mani jewels found in Buddhist scripture. In Buddhism, the Chintamani is said to be one of four relics that came in a chest that fell from the sky. Many terma fell from the sky in caskets during the reign of King Laha of Tibet. Though the king did not understand the purpose of the objects, he kept them in a position of reverence. 
Several years later, two mysterious strangers appeared at the court of the king explaining the four relics, which included the Buddha's bowl, possibly a singing bowl, and Amani stone with Om Mani Padme Hum mantra inscribed on it. These few objects were the bringers of the Dharma to Tibet. A money jewel, a magical jewel which manifests whatever one wishes for, according to one's desires. Treasures, clothing, and food can be manifested, while sickness and suffering can be removed. Water can be purified. It is a metaphor for the teachings and virtues of the Buddha, said to be obtained from the dragon king of the sea, or the head of a great fish, or the relics of a Buddha. So it's a mythological object here we're talking about. The Chintamani Stone. Looks like my light has fallen yet again. Just a moment. Come on now. Let's play nice. Thank you. We are back. Okay, yeah, the Chintamani Stone. A wishing stone that fell from the sky in a casket of some type. And Rourke was said to be in possession of this and had to return it to the hollow earth. Nothing less than that. So that's like how crazy the mythology goes when it's attached to Rourke. And, you know, we mentioned that he saw a silvery disc in the sky over Tibet. Some UFOlogists claim this was evidence that they saw a UFO uh, during their expeditions. I wouldn't put it past them to see a UFO out there in the, in the wilds of the uh, unexplored Asian regions that they were uh you know, traversing through during these lengthy expeditions they had undertaken. So I find it personally a fascinating study in the life of Nicholas Rourke. I would love to go check out his museum. I know it's, it's up in New York, so it's not like super far away, but uh, you know, you know, with things being the way they are, <sighs> Tina Tomaszewski says we need that stone to wish Pete's light. And stay stuck on the wall. Yeah, that would that would be uh, that would be uh, thank heaven for small favors with that wishing stone. S. Edward says my pet rock is actually magical. Sounds like something I would have come up with as a kid. Well, these magical rocks fell out of the sky. They fell out of the sky in the ancient past. <clears throat> Dennis Martin points out Rorick may have been a Russian spy, possibly. You know, uh, I could see why people would level that accusation at him and, and why some would think that. Uh, and maybe in the tradition of other occultists like John D., you know, who was also accused of being a spy for the crown, uh, maybe that'd be the case. Maybe that would be the case. Uh, Tina also points out that rocks falling from the sky sounds kind of dangerous. Well, it happens all the time. I mean, you got meteorites or just rocks that fall out of the sky. You know? When it comes down to it, there's just rocks that fall from space. A massive one wiped out the dinosaurs once upon a time. Planet Dinosaur was once what it was down here. Planet of the Monsters. You know, I don't know. Uh, and, and as a quick aside, I find it so strange to think there could not be life out there in this universe because you consider at one point the only life on this planet was literally the planet of the monsters. It was literally a planet with Godzilla's running around on it, eating each other. So I don't know. I don't know about that. I, that's why I personally believe that there's, you know, there's got to be some some kind of uh, life forms out there in the galaxy somewhere. Whether they're uh, intelligent enough to, uh, you know, come and uh, contact us or not, that's that's another question entirely. But hey, it's hat time. 
Hey there, hi there, how you doing? I want to thank you guys for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate you being here and spending some time with us as we delve into another mystery. And this mystery has been fun. The story of Nicholas Rorick and the Chintamani Stone, a magical wishing stone that fell from the sky in eons past that perhaps he was in possession of. And perhaps one of his Asian expeditions' purpose was to return it to its original spot with the rest of the Chintamani Stone, kept in the hollow earth by the king of the world at Shambhala. So fun stuff. I hope you're getting down with that tonight because that's what we're talking about. Now listen, if you're new here, please subscribe. Click that notification bell so you never miss a live stream. We do this every Monday through Friday at 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I hope you get down with what we do here. It's a lot of fun to talk about these strange mysteries and explore them. And, uh, and what I like to do is for the first half of the show, we delve into the mystery. And for the second half of the show, we talk about it. Uh, but right here in the middle, what I like to do is take the opportunity to ask you to check out the description of this video to find links to my Twitter and my email, my Instagram, my P.O. Box, if you'd like to send me some books. If you'd like to support the show, there's a couple ways to do that. You can go through PayPal or Patreon for a dollar a month. That's a quarter a week, less than the price of a cup of coffee. You can help support the stream. And for those of you that do, both new and old, I thank you for backing it with your buck and believing in what we do here. You can also check out the Spring Store that has fun merchandise inspired by the esoteric and the extraterrestrial, the spiritual and the supernatural, and all that lies between. Uh, I've got Hermes Trismegistus t-shirts, Resist Reptilians hoodies, Hollow Earth leggings, and coffee mugs of all varieties. So come on, check it out. It helps support the stream. I'm sure you'll find something you love. Lastly, if you ever miss the show, you can always find us wherever you get your podcasts, like Spotify, like Spreaker, and iHeartRadio. So thank you so much for being here. Now, let's get into the second half of the show and see what you think. <laughs> All right. And that bell means halftime is over. We move into the second half of the show here. So getting into the second half of the show, I really want to pick your rise brains on this topic. Oh, we got another super chat coming in here real quick. Let me go ahead and get caught up here. Darius Munchausen. Thank you, Darius. Much appreciated. Darius with a dollar forty nine with a popcorn a popping. And we do appreciate that. Thank you so much, Darius. <clears throat> So let's see. Yes, we got lots of digging going on in the chat. Fun stuff. Some talk about moldavite in the chat. Some talk about stones. We should do a whole show about stones and crystals. I wish I knew more about them. You know, I wish I was an expert on stones and crystals, but I'm sure I could dig up some information we could talk about here. So, yeah. The Chintamani Stone. What would you do with the Wishing Stone, I wonder? I wonder how many wishes you get from a Wishing Stone. Your Moldavite is interesting, uh, as many people in the chat seem to agree. But does it grant wishes? Another monster mentions Dolomite, which is absolutely one of my favorite films of all time. I think Dolomite is a really good movie, personally. It's so it's so bad that it's good. There's boom mics in the shot, and uh, you know the acting isn't super great. It's just uh, hilarious, though. Dolomite. I've seen every Dolomite movie. Fantastic stuff. I haven't seen the Eddie Murphy movie where he plays Dolomite. I still haven't seen that yet. I should watch that though. That uh, that's probably on my list. Got to check my Netflix list. It's extensive. I've got fun stuff on there, like Gundam. Got to catch up on that too. Really want to, really want to get into that. Really curious about it. Anywho, <clears throat> so how do you guys feel about this Nicholas Rorick? Uh, Man Ray of Hope would bring my mom back to life. That's really depressing, Man Ray. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but that's some sad shit, man. Ray. At least it's honest, though. It's pure and honest. Very, very, very sad, though. Another monster says, I wish to be the stone. Then you get all the wishes. Thanks, Wonder Woman. Uh, I don't know how that works with Wonder Woman. 
But uh, yeah. The wishing stone, a wishing stone. Treasures can be yours, clothing, food, all of it. Whatever you dream of, I think, can be uh, subject to the wishing stone. And Rorick, I think, had a fascinating life. And, and you know, we, we touched on the fact that he was a theosophist, but we didn't really delve into theosophy. Theosophy is such an interesting study. And that, I mean, I've come back to it over and over again during the streams you know, talking about theosophy and theosophical ideas. And, you know, it was Helena Blavatsky and, uh, you know, a couple of her cohorts, like Henry Alcott uh, and Alice Bailey, who would really develop theosophy over the years. Uh, but Blavatsky moved to India with Olcott. They established the society's headquarters. Uh, she wrote Isis Unveiled and the Secret Doctrine. Uh, you know, like she was in communication with ascended masters of theosophy and, and Rorick bought into all this stuff. <clears throat> Sapphire Elf. Uh, what was the phrase said that the Rorix, when he was presented with the stone, something about don't beware its power, but the will to use it. Are you ready? Sounds like some sobering warnings before having possession of the stone. I don't know how Rorik came into possession of the stone. There's a painting of him holding a box, which some believe contain the stone. It's like a self portrait where Rorik is holding this box that some believe contains the Chintamani stone that he was taking back to Tibet to return to the hollow earth. Uh, another monster says, don't watch Wonder Woman 1984. It's better if you don't understand that reference. Yeah, I have not watched Wonder Woman uh, 1984. I, I don't know how that works uh, because, uh, you know, Wonder Woman doesn't age. And the last movie was like World War One. And then Chris Pine's alive again, so I don't know how that works. And frankly, I don't care to know. So I don't think I'll be watching Wonder Woman eighty four. Um, I, I just, I, I just have no interest. I did like the Snyder Cut, the Justice League Snyder Cut. I was a fan of that. I thought that was pretty decent. I think it really fixed a lot of the mistakes that the theatrical cut made. I especially think the cyborg arc was a lot much better in the Snyder cut. I mean, you get so much more of his story really is the heart of the, the story there. It makes a lot more sense. So, yeah, I mean, it's a four hour movie, but if you're into DC comic superheroes, or at least the way I used to be when I was younger, you might enjoy it. Anyway, I digress. We were talking about Rorick and the Chintamani stone. Uh, Rorick pact was signed at the white house in 1935. Uh, you know, Rorick nominated for Nobel Beast Prizes. Yeah. So it's an interesting life. It's definitely an interesting life and an interesting person. And, you know, you have this mythology wrapped up around him. Did he see a UFO? Was he in possession of a magic wishing stone? Did he achieve his goal of getting to Shambhala, you know, this mythical place of Shambhala, you know, and he wanted to set up a, uh, a new religious movement was his goal. One to unify the peoples of Asia. Lofty goals. The man had lofty goals, uh, very, very focused on peace and ideas like that. But, you know, who knows the truth about anybody? Who knows the truth about anybody? But definitely someone who was consumed by the occult and the mysterious. So, yeah.
Dennis Martin says he came across an ancient Buddhist monastery in Mongolia, and there was a huge tower in the middle of the place. One of the monks there gave it to him along with that morning. Oh, okay. So that's how he comes into possession of the Chintamani stone to begin with, because he got it in Mongolia and he had to take it back to Tibet. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, that's interesting stuff. I think it's just a, a great story. I think it's definitely somebody interesting to look into. Um, I would recommend, guys, Google his artwork. You know, Google some of his artwork. See what you think of that. A lot of it's landscapes. There's, uh, there's some religious stuff. It's a pretty good one called The Last Angel from 1912. Bridge of Glory from 1923. They almost do have a hypnotic quality to them. Mother of the World, 1924. Another interesting art piece of artwork from him. So, yeah, if you just Google his name and artwork or his paintings, you'll get a plethora of images and you'll see what I mean, like, you know, of his paintings of these hillside monasteries and these strange stones and mountaintop landscapes. He had been to all these places. You know, he was painting things that he saw because he was out there in the wilderness of Mongolia and Tibet in the 1920s and 30s. Searching for something. And this isn't the first time I've covered Nicholas Rorick here on the channel. I mean, we did a video on the Chintamani stone years ago, years ago, uh, just regarding the Chintamani stone falling from heaven and Nicholas Rorick's role in returning it to the hollow earth. Big Steve, what's up, Big Steve? How you doing? Howdy all, please smack that. Thumbs up for the homie. Thanks, and a big heart. Well, thank you, Big Steve. Exactly. Hit that like button, folks, while you're here, if you're having a good time. Dennis Martin says when Crowley was out climbing K2, he was also searching for Agartha. They don't just come right out and tell you that. No, of course not. Of course not. You know, they 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 have these uh, other excuses for these expeditions, but they're actually looking for, uh, you know, various esoteric secrets. <clears throat> There you go. Tina's got the link to it. The alien artifact of incredible power that could change the world. Man, I used to know how to title a video, didn't I? I don't think I title videos well enough anymore. I got to work on that. I think they're not sensational enough to get people's attention. We'll see. We'll see. I got to work on my title cracking. Cracking out better titles. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll work on it. We'll get back to base. We'll work on it. Go back into the laboratory. Tool things up. <clears throat> back to the drawing board, as they used to say in the cartoons of bygone eras when I was a young man. Speaking of which, uh, you know, I recently heard this. Dairy Queen used to have Dennis the Menace as its mascot up until the year 2001. And then they got rid of Dennis the Menace. And you know why they got rid of Dennis the Menace as their mascot? Because by 2001, nobody knew who the hell Dennis the Menace was anymore. They figured young people didn't know who Dennis the Menace was, so it was useless to have him as the mascot anymore. So that's where Dennis the Menace went when it goes to Dairy Queen. But he had been the mascot for Dairy Queen for something like 40 years. Like since the fifties or something, <laughs> or since Dairy Queen had been around. <clears throat> Sapphire Elf points out the Chintamani stone was said to be yellow and blue. There's a few different descriptions as if it may have changed colors or have been liquid filled. You know, I can't even conceptualize what the Chintamani stone would have looked like because it fell from space. You know what I mean? So is it some kind of meteor? I like the idea that it's liquid-filled. I, th I find that pretty fascinating. I think that's a pretty interesting 
way to kind of look at it. And, uh, you know, I'm right on board with, the, with that kind of thinking. Right on board with it. Like a lava lamp, says Sapphire Elf. Yeah, liquid filled like a lava lamp. Just something going on where it's encased like that. You know, and I think of like, you know, you go throughout time, these ancient writings, the Book of Thoth or the Emerald Tablets or the Corpus Hermeticum or, you know, the other sacred writings that have existed throughout time and space. Uh, and the Chintamani Stone might be one of these things too. Like, does it have anything inscribed on it or is it just a magical wishing stone? <laughs> Just title the video, a bunch of people that do stuff with things and creepiness ensues. <laughs> How you doing, Ginger? Good to see you, man. Everybody, Ginger Viking Jesus is here. Good to see you, Ginger. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Maurice Spann's here as well. Good to see you, Maurice Spann. What about the blue sky stone found in Sierra Leone, Africa? Uh, I'm not familiar with that one, Elroy. The blue sky stone. I think there's all kinds of fascinating and interesting stones. You know, I was going to do a video about that at one point called Sacred Stones regarding to various stones around the world that have kind of been thought of as special and sacred. Uh, you know, uh, the first one that comes to mind is in the Kaaba in Mecca. There's uh, the black stone of the Kaaba that's in there. Uh, also, the Chintamani stone is something that comes to mind. Uh, you know, so there's various stones, I think, you know, desert glass, you know, these kind of things that uh, have been coveted or venerated in some ways throughout the ages for various different properties. You know, think of like lapis lazuli and how its use by the Egyptians was replete throughout their works. Beautiful stone, beautiful stone. You know, Tina points out they have Nicholas Rourke prints on Amazon too. Some already framed. So there you go. You can pick up your Nicholas Rourke art. You know, I wanted to pick up some David Huggins art while uh, while I was still out there and get some of his prints. Oh, Macca Random's here. How you doing, Macca? Thanks for tuning in tonight. Dennis Martin says, evidently, it would enhance psychic powers. One Mongolian priest told that when touched it, he saw the world's past and the future. Wow, just by touching the stone. Can you imagine the properties of a magical wishing stone where you touch it and you can see the past and the future, where it's able to like inter interfere with your thought process or link with you psychically? Uh, you know, I always think about crystal skulls when it comes to something like that. You know, the idea of the uh, crystal skulls being a means to transmit information that they were, you know, used to store ancient information by the ancients who created them. And, you know, I know there's a, a lot of people say the skull of doom was carved in the 1800s. But, I mean, you don't see people making these perfect crystal skulls nowadays. You know, I mean, you can buy uh, mass produced crystal skulls. Sure. But none of them are going to be like the skull of doom. Sapphire Elf points out time travel is theoretically plausible. There must be some place where past, present, and future exist at the same time. And perhaps somewhere the Chintamani Stone can tie into that. Or tap into those energies to reveal the secrets of the past and present and future. I know the Chronovisor was something that, uh, you know, uh, was it Father Ernetti was said to have cooked up. Uh, this priest who created a device that could view the past.
Team Tomczewski says you can get quartz skulls in Mexico for next to nothing, really cheap. Well, I'm sure you gotta go. Go to Mexico and get your crystal skulls. Interesting stuff, though. Interesting stuff. I always wanted to have a nice crystal skull. I always thought that would be fun. Have a nice little crystal skull. Never found one that really struck my fancy enough to pull the trigger on it, though. You know what I mean? I don't think I've done enough uh, deep research into finding a crystal skull. I, You know, I keep hearing about a crystal skull that they advertise on uh, Fade to Black. I got to look into that. I got to check out that one because they supercharge that one with a mother crystal skull that imparts its energy on it. So you're getting real energized crystal skull action. Maurice Bain Gaming. I got an alien crystal skull. It's full of vodka. <laughs> I've seen those in the store before. The crystal skulls and the skull vodka. Yeah, the Dan Aykroyd crystal skull vodka. I've seen those. Yeah, that's pretty comical stuff. Well, Dan Aykroyd's into all that weird stuff, too. Like, he's into all the Illuminati, UFO, you know, uh, kind of stories that come up here. Jay Loza, will you talk about the Crystal Skulls? I could do a show about the Crystal Skulls. I mean, we haven't done one in a while uh, regarding the Crystal Skulls. I don't know how much there is to talk about, so we might go off on a lot of tangents, but we'll see. I'm going to jot down the Crystal Skulls here in my creepy little book. Crystal Skulls. So uh, just jot it down here in the creepy little book. A sapphire elf dash, but does it also have flecks of gold leaf in it? Goldschlager is the one with the flecks of gold leaf in it. Goldschlager. I remember that one from when I was in my 20s. Yeah, Goldschlager. Goldschlager and Rumplemints and Sambuca, all those flavorful spirits. Flavorful spirits, if you will. I haven't had any of that in a while. I've got a little rum in the uh, cabinet, a little bit of rum in there, a little Bacardi. I was making a strawberry daiquiris one day. I do like slushy drinks. <laughs> I do think they are fun, but that, you know, that's just me. I like leisure suits and, you know, slushy drinks. Uh, no, not Maurice, not spice, just uh, the regular clear white rum. Mayorto, how you doing? Mayorto Bob Lazar mentions a piece of equipment that had its own gravity and was impossible to even touch it. I wonder if these stones are more like alien trinkets. Well, that could be the case. That could be the case that they have an alien connection. You know, and that's something I speculated, in, you know, a couple of years back when I did my Chintamani stone video. I think that I speculated on the alien origin of those kind of devices. Carol's Cookie says, slushy drinks and tracksuits. I feel this has been said before on here. Yes. <clears throat> Ginger's asking if I've done a streamer video on spiritual possession as opposed to demonic possession before, and I'm spacing on it. Well, I think what you're talking about is spiritual mediumship, when someone allows a spirit to kind of overshadow them, and then the spirit speaks through the medium. Uh, I don't think I've any, done anything specific on it, uh, but that's another thing I should jot down to, mediumship. Yeah, and if you guys got suggestions, keep them coming. I'll just jot them down. I've got the creepy little book right here, everybody. It's right here in my hands. I got my pen ready. I'm ready to go. So let's see. A spiritual possession. All right, Ginger. It's noted down. Spiritual possession. Elvis Shredding recommends a pineapple screwdriver. Well, I do love pineapple juice. That's what I was mixing with the rum, in fact. 
I wanted to make pina coladas, but the supermarket was out of coconut cream. So I just used pineapple and, and rum. That's, you know, that's what I did. Um, yeah, I do like pineapple juice quite a bit. I'm going to pick up some mango juice next time I get to the supermarket. Big jug of that. Uh, what's it? Uh, I forget the name of the brand. Naked juice. Yeah. Just it's a real thick mango juice. It's pretty good. You want to you want to get down with some mangoes. <clears throat> Sapphire Elf, what other mythical items fell from the sky? Maybe there is a connection. Well, I believe the black stone at the Kaaba fell from the sky as well, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, oh, macaranum. I had pineapple and rum earlier. There you go. You can't go wrong with pineapple and a little rum. Like I said, I was trying to make pina coladas, but they were all out of coconut cream. And I'm not a huge coconut fan, but I do like pina coladas. So, uh, so I wanted to make them. I used to be a bartender, so you know I can make a decent drink. And uh, I was really in the mood for them, but uh, you know, without the coconut cream, it was like, well, I guess I just got pineapple and rum, which is. Uh, you know, not a bad combo either. Elroy Shredding says, slushy drinks, tracksuit preacher. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, I got that going for me these days. Slushy drinks and my tracksuits. And getting caught in the rain suggests another monster. Yes, I do like pina coladas. If you like pina coladas. <laughs> oh, it's fun stuff. That's fun stuff. Yeah, it's good times. It's good times. I was getting these uh, frozen pops from the liquor store. They were like, you know, like when your kids used to get the freezer pops, they were like that, but they got rum in them. So I had some of those, which is what led me to get the pineapple rum anyway, because I was having pina colada frozen pops. And, uh, you know, then uh, then I got some of these wine frozen pops. They're okay. They're fruit flavored, but they're, they're, they're a wine based freezer pop. So, I mean, they're all right. They're not as good as the rum ones. Alba Yards are used to make to die for margaritas. You can't go wrong with a good margarita. My wife's a big fan of margaritas. I don't really like tequila myself. It uh, doesn't react well. I don't react well on tequila. Don't react well on it at all. My face gets all red. Jay Loza says you need Myers rum for pina coladas. That's the thing. I needed a dark rum too because I didn't. I didn't have a dark rum to go with it. I just had the white rum. So that's how it goes. Anyway, listen. I've been talking about pina coladas over here, and I haven't been paying attention to the time, and I don't want to go overboard. So let me go ahead and play you guys a quick video, and I'll be right back. This kind of broadcasting only works in this country. Here in America, we put on the programs that you enjoy, and we simply come to you and ask you to support them. Help this system of broadcasting work. We need to hear from you. We also are looking for a lot of new subscribers right now. So please, become a new subscriber and help us reach our goal of 12,000 new subscribers. But the most important thing is to get that money in and into our studios right away so that we can bring you more programs like this. And you can do that on a Visa, MasterCard, or American Express. Okay, okay. You know how I like it to be nice and upbeat when we say goodnight. So listen, I want to say thank you to Deranged Lunatic, a.k.a. DL, and Darius Munchausen for your generous super chats. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you to our moderators, Team Tomaszewski and Macarena42 for being here tonight. Thank you for tuning in tonight and holding it down in the chat for us. Much appreciation. 
Thank you to each and every one of you for hanging out. For spending some time with us. Oh, Big Steve, too. Sorry, Big Steve. Didn't mean to forget you there. Thanks for being here, Big Steve. Uh, but thank you guys for hanging out. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something new, had fun while you were at it. And, uh, you know, uh, we enjoy each other's company. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for spending your time with us. Thanks for being awesome. Check out the description of this video for links to my Twitter and Instagram. Please follow me on social media. If you're on social media, follow me over there. Just do it. Just I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. So I'm trying to get to like a thousand followers on Twitter. I think that's a humble amount of followers to have considering I don't tweet a whole lot. But follow me over there so I can keep you updated on shows when I do tweet. Um, also Instagram, because I think Instagram's, you know, probably the least cesspool of all these social networks. Uh, you know, check it out. Anyway, my email's down there, my P.O. box, if you want to send me some books. Also ways to support the stream, PayPal, Patreon, or the Teespring store where you can pick up some fun merch. Uh, my second channel, Dark Sayings, is also linked down in the description down here if you want to check out some of the audiobook recordings that I've done. I thank you for your time again. Thank you for your energy and thank you for contributions to these conversations, making this show what it is. Until then, uh, tomorrow night, uh, that's going to wrap it up for me. I am Pete. This has been a creepy little book. And until next time, stay creeped out.